This is my first Mother's Day as an adoptive mother. And that has been a long road and a long journey of trusting God. And so that's been the core of the message today for all of us. And all of us can relate as mothers that it's hard. It's hard to be a mom. It's hard to raise kids in general. It's hard to do the best you can, show as much love that you need to give them on a daily basis, pick up the bobos, you know, pick up the mess, uh, and have enough grace and enough patience to carry on continually day in, day out. So I applaud all of you mothers in the room that are, some of you are mom to a lot of kids. All right, Kim over there, so I'm going to call you out. Mm. <laughs> more grace, Jesus. Everybody just stretch your hand and say, thank you, Jesus, for more and more grace <laughs> upon this mama here. And we are so just blessed to be anointed by God for this purpose. And I got to say that God has anointed and graced every woman to carry life into the world. Now, it doesn't matter how it happens. Amen. Amen. God is so much bigger than that. But there, I know people on the mission field who just adopted and adopted and adopted. And they have more kids than they could ever fly on an airplane, you know, to come home. It's just incredible that the amount of love a mom can show and that mothering heart. And, and so I've been blessed to see some spiritual mamas in my life and to have a calling or a purpose on your life to be a spiritual mom is probably one of the biggest rewards, I would say, about as you, as you get older and graced and wisdom and you start passing that wisdom on to the women around you and to the younger women coming up, I think that that is just such an honoring position. So I honor you mothers in this place who are grandmoms, great grandmoms too. Like we need your wisdom and we need your years of experience to continue to be passed on, amen, to the next generation. And, and I'm so thankful for my mom who's in the back right now helping with the kids. She's a trooper, <laughs> Mama Des. She has been one of those moms my whole life. Um, I've been blessed to see a mom that just pours out love on people, just pours out her heart. She would come out in the sun and the summertime where we'd be growing up, grew up in California. And I just remember us kids playing and getting dirty, you know, just enjoying life, being a kid. And here come mom with a plate. <laughs> she set it down and we just all, yeah, you know, <laughs> and tackle the food and grapes in our mouth, strawberries and apples, and we're just like, thanks, Mom, you know, and <laughs> go back to play. And it's just like, it was the best. It's some of the, still some of the best memories of childhood I have is just those little acts of love Mom would do. She'd just come and drop a plate of food, all those kids would devour it, and we'd just be like, thank you, Mom, you know, <laughs> and keep on playing. And it's like, that's kind of the role sometimes of moms is they keep everything going, but you know, you kind of, you just get back to doing what you do. And I admire that, it is beautiful. And I've had days where I feel more graced to be mom. And some days I'm like, there is zero grace today. I text my husband, you need to come home quick. <laughs> come home, I need help. <laughs> the grace is gone. <laughs> I'm sure all of us can relate. <laughs> and so, but God is with us in the good and the bad, no matter what. He will never leave us or forsake us. And so today, um, I've got a message to share from my heart, and that is how to trust God through the mystery, through the mysteries of life. Um, and I've gone around and around, like, the title, so I'm like, okay, we got to trust God through the mystery, but we also, it's about submitting ourselves to his plan and to his way. So if you want to title it in your own notes, you know, well, submitting to the mystery of God's plan. That's another good title, right? So I'll, y'all choose which one you want to pick. <laughs> but it's, yes, submitting to the mysteries of God's plan. How many of you know, like, people in the Bible, well, they didn't always know what, what God's plan was. They didn't always know what direction to go. They didn't always know where to get started. But yet, in the Bible, we see just a hull, a hull of, like, people who lived a life of faith. It's like it could definitely fill a skyscraper, you know? Like, there's just so many people in the Bible and these stories that we have who inspire us, who get us through the good and the bad days, who inspire us to be more, to become more, to believe God for more. 
And so one of my favorite passages, I want to get started, and I'll help Brandon out here because I know I have way too many scriptures, I'll admit. I confess that. I'm a woman that likes a lot of word, and I don't know how to narrow it down. But <laughs> Hebrews 11, it's a good place to start on the area of faith and of trust and people and obedience. I'm going to read Hebrews 1, and I'm going to pray. So from Hebrews 11, verse 1, tells us that faith shows the reality of what we hope for, and it's the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. And that word just really stood out to me this week when I was reading that. I was like, a good reputation? That's what they earned. They earned a good reputation. And I think it's in Proverbs, too. You know, it says a good reputation, like to build a good name, is more valuable than rubies, than gold, than riches. So there's things that sometimes we lose in the modern day that in the kingdom of heaven are on a higher value. And the higher value is like having a good name built, having a good reputation. Like these are things that God loves and that we should all aim for. Um, it's, you know, like last week, Pastor Justin talking about like how to be great. What is great? You know, what is greatness? And it was about biblically, when we look at what greatness is, it's being a servant of all. It's the upside down kingdom. And it's the opposite of how man tries to get us all looking in the wrong direction, you know, chasing after being great in this way of having this many followers, this many people notice me. And it's not so. That's not what God's going to judge us on. He's not even going to be judging us on that kind of spectrum at all. And it's actually unfair to ourselves to think that he does. It could be very unfair to our soul, to our confidence, you know, to our emotions, especially as women. I know you're always comparing. And the world makes you try to compare to the next person. And none of that matters. None of that matters. God looks at the heart. And thank God he does. You know, I'm so thankful for that. It's, it can set you free. We realize that. Like, God's not looking for us to be this super powerful, great, wealthy, influential, like, everything. If he calls you that, great. But it's like, he just wants you to be a pure soul that knows how to love. And where do we learn to love best? From looking at him. At Jesus. Amen. So, Father God, just tonight, I just pray, Lord, that you anoint me to just share my heart with the personal journey that you have had me on, Father. It's been such an honor. It's been such an honor, and I'm, I'm so thankful that I've been on this journey with you of trust in the middle of things I didn't understand, in the middle of things that were so hard at times I thought it would crush me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have every one of us in your hands tonight. We thank you for your love and your comfort, Lord. Thank you that your plans are good for us, no matter what we face, no matter what we go through. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. So, all right, I'm already crying, y'all. Thank you for the tissues, Tamika. <laughs> so, my story, where does it begin? Well, <laughs> we have the Hall of Faith people, awesome faith builders. All of these people had to trust God and walk on a journey with God and the things unknown to them. So one of our first people I want to read about would be Abraham, right? This really got me the other day when I was reading this. In Hebrews 11, 8, it says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him and his inheritance. He went, listen to this, he went without knowing where he was going. Now, men, how many times are you driving? And your wife's like, hey, um, do you know where we're going? <laughs> Are you lost? <laughs> Can you just picture Abraham? <laughs> Abraham. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah being like, honey, do you know where we're going? Where are we going? Um, what's going to be there when we get there? <laughs> Are you sure you have the right directions? Did God tell you which place? And he, all his answers are going to be like, no, no, honey, I don't know. <laughs> Let's trust God. And they were on a journey of faith together. But it's just comical when we think about it. You know, we picture them in the ancient world. But when you picture them today, like driving and Siri's got them on some, you know, one of those weird, crazy corners that she does from time to time. Thank you, Siri. <laughs> that has happened 
to Pastor Dustin and I multiple times when Siri especially was new. I don't, I don't know. We were trying to find an airport, and we ended up, like, behind the airport in, like, some back, like, parking lot. And I'm like, there's the airplanes. <laughs> we're supposed to be over there. <laughs> the directions just led us way off course. <laughs> so I, I picture Abraham stepping out to obey God into the unknown, into the mystery, God calling him to leave his home, everything he's ever known. And he doesn't know where to go. He went without knowing. But it was a step-by-step thing of trust. Step by, say, faith is a walk. Trust is a walk. Being guided by the Lord in our life, how to be led, well, it starts with a walk. And God, get this, our Father God, in his great mysterious sense of humor sometimes, he likes the mystery. He, He likes not telling us everything. Um, that's quite his characteristic. We even see that with Jesus, like how he resurrected and hid like his identity and just kind of like snuck undercover, wanted to hear what they were saying about him. Like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> There's some of that mysterious nature of our Father God. He enjoys it. He enjoys when we seek him, when we kind of search him out like he's playing hide and seek with us as kids in a way. And so when he asked him to step out, Abraham and his family to go, Abraham went without knowing where God was leading them But they reached, it says, the land that God promised him. I feel like they skipped a lot there. (laughs) There must have been a whole lot that happened to get them there, but they got there. Hallelujah. Say, you may not know which direction you're going tonight, but if you keep walking with them, you're going to get there. Amen. And he lived there, it says, by faith. Say faith. It was a faith act to even live there. Because guess what? He got to the place God was promising him. And it says he was living as a foreigner in tents. So imagine we're in Chattanooga, all right? They're building housing communities everywhere. But picture long before everything's built like it is, if you were walking into a foreign land, there wouldn't be a house on the market for you to probably rent or buy. You would have to build it. And so as a foreigner, you would be identified by how you lived you would be standing out from the rest of people. So it was clear that Abraham, when he got there, he was a foreigner. He, would have, he was living in a tent in a temporary shelter. Come on, I'm already preaching. Somebody, we're, our, we're here on earth, and we're living in a temporary shelter, amen? This, this, ain't, this body ain't permanent. This life ain't permanent, you know? So moving right along, we got more to share. (laughs) He was a foreigner living in a tent. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. And what was that promise? God said, I'm going to give you this land, this inheritance, this promised land. And Abraham was confidently, it said, looking toward, forward to a city. Listen to this. With eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. That's where his faith was coming from. You know, some of us wonder, where's, where's that faith coming from? Where's that, how can he just step out and do that? Well, it says he's confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. And it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man, and one woman who was as good as dead. That's the Bible. I didn't paraphrase. It says they were as good as dead. She was past birthing years, and he was up there too. You know, men have a little longer, but still, it's like saying he was like dead too. So it's like God birthed a nation through two old, dried up, dead folks. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> I mean, look, at God called them as good as dead. I didn't say it. Okay, that's what the Bible says. And a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way it says to count them. That is crazy, y'all. Living their whole life wondering if God's going to keep a promise to them about a child. And now, what do we see? From a life of faith and trust in the mystery, in the unknown, we see a nation more than it says we could even count. Y'all remember in 
the Old Testament and them saying, God says, Abraham, Abraham, get out of your tent. And he's like, go look at the stars. And Abraham looks up at the sky and he looks up and he's like, how many stars do you see? God's, God's just kind of baiting him, you know? You see the playful side of God here. He's just like, how many stars do you see? You know, when you're showing your kids something, isn't that the same way that you talk to them sometimes? It's like, well, what do you see over there? I talk to our little girl. We'll be like, Daisy, 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 you see that butterfly? You see that? And she's like, oh, a butterfly. You know? <laughs> and just this wonderment. Just this wonderment. And it's so precious. I, I love that about the ch the, just the childlike years are just so precious. And I'm eating it up right now. I'm loving every minute of it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> So he asked him to get out of his tent. Look at the stars. Can you imagine? Can you count it? And Abraham's just like, no. <laughs> it's more than I can count, more than I can fathom. And God's like, exactly. This is what I want to do for you. This is, this is where your descendants are going to look like. And it was a long road to get there. And Abraham was an old man. 25 years or so, I think it was about 25 years from the time that God spoke to them about having a child, which by the way, he was already old. <laughs> he was already old. Imagine waiting another 25 years when you're already, you know, the expiration date is here, guys. <laughs> another 25 years, Abraham, Sarah, sorry. <sighs> and they held on. Now they did make a few wavering mistakes. We know this. They tried to take control of God's plan. And by doing this, they created an Ishmael, which God still blessed, by the way. He's so good. So even when, I mean, I just want to encourage you with that. All of us in this room have made some Ishmaels. You know, all of us have made mistakes. All of us have in the road of faith and trust when things are dark, when things are completely unclear. We've been like, all right, well, God spoke this to us, so let's... Let's try to figure it out, you know. Maybe, maybe we need to play detective and figure out how this is supposed to play out, and maybe we need to, you know, put on our, our Sherlock Holmes outfit and be like, all right, let's, let's, let's study what God said. Let's study, the, you know, and, and let's make something happen. Ooh, anybody ever try to make something happen? <laughs> More times than I can count. <laughs> so they did. They they made something happen, and they created an Ishmael. However, God still blessed them. It wasn't God's plan, and he even followed up. It's like, Abraham, you're going to still have a child, but it's not Ishmael. It's going to be through you and Sarah. God was honoring even Sarah's faithfulness in this, you know? Like, it's beautiful. Like, God's even honoring her as a woman. Like, she had felt like God had completely abandoned her, I'm sure. I mean, to the point where she even laughed when someone said, you know, she's going to be pregnant by this time next year. She's like, ha! <laughs> she still loved God. She's still a godly woman. But it's like, okay, God. She'd gone to that point where it's like, it may not be happening, you know? But in this book of the Bible, Hebrews 11, it was so beautiful, guys, is even though we know they wavered, and they were like us in a lot of ways, they chose to walk the route of faith into the dark, into the unknown, and to this day, there is a nation on the earth that has the most people, the most favor of God on it, and God counted them as righteous, and guess what? We're all counted in part of Abraham's family, too, as a result of this couple's faith and sticking to it and not giving up. It is so inspiring. It's so inspiring. And they weren't perfect. So there you go. We can relate. We're not perfect. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're imperfect. But if you stay with God, he always fulfills his promises. Always. As long as we stay with him. You just stay with him long enough. You just keep at it. Keep going on that journey. You may be in the dark. You may be trying to figure out how it's going to all work out. But trust that he's got your back because he loves you. You're his kid. He still has got nothing but good in mind for each one of us. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your good. He's good. He is a good father. And look at what got these people through. It's incredible because they go on and on. Yes, there's a lot of faith here. There's a lot of trust. 
There was a lot of steps they had to take, but they walked with God, and guess what? They did get their promised child. They did. They got Isaac. He finally came, hallelujah. And when he did, one day, God said, Abraham, I need you to go sacrifice Isaac. I can't imagine what went through Abraham's head. Now, Hebrews gives us a little bit of a hindsight look because it says Abraham reasoned in Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19. You can look this up. Abraham reasoned. Okay, if Isaac died, God's able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead because Abraham decided, I'm going to obey God. And God was testing Abraham here. This was not like God being seductive or evil. He was testing Abraham's heart because God had a plan to bless the seed on Abraham's life for generation to generation to generation to generation till today. And so he had to test this man to see, is he willing to even get up, give up the very beautiful promise he's waited his whole life for in his love and trust of me? And he put Abraham to the test, and guess what? Abraham passed with flying colors. <laughs> and Isaac, give him props too, as we say child, but he was a young man. He was a teenager, probably a little younger than Brandon here, who we just celebrated graduating. You know, picture a young teenager, like strong. Abraham is really old. Remember how long he waited to become a dad? Like, he's really old now, so Isaac, we know, could easily overpower his father if he wanted to so that means that even isaac was submitted to this knowing that god is to be trusted god whatever god said okay dad let's do that you know if god's going to raise me up then okay let's do it it's like what faith and trust his son had and it's just beautiful to see what god did as a result of it but all of them all of them all these people in this chapter, one thing they got in common, like how did they do these things? You know, how does someone grow up in the land of Egypt as a Pharaoh's son, Moses, but then refuse the possessions, refuse the inheritance he could have rightfully had as an adopted heir? He said, no, I'm going to identify with God's people and I'm going to take on their oppression. And he chose to walk away from that. That was an act of faith, the Bible says. And it was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea onto dry ground. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city. Oh, it would take too long, the Bible says, to recount the stories of faith. There's too many. But guess what? By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. That's got to be talking about Daniel. <laughs> they quenched the flames of fire. They escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength, and they became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight in verse 34. And it says women received their loved ones even back again from the dead. But others were tortured refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. Isn't that beautiful to look at death when you're trusting in God with your life? You look at death as freedom because you're promised to be resurrected into a newness of life. And Jesus said, behold, I make all things new again. He's like, guess what, guys? You want to find your life? You got to lose it. You got to lay it down. So to give up your life means you're going to find life, which means you got nothing to lose. And that is one of the common denominators we see of great men and women of God used in such a way to do such incredible things, to attempt incredible things for the Lord. It's because they knew if we got nothing to lose, there's nothing holding us back. If God be for us, who can be against us? What is man that they could kill this body and you just send me to be in the presence of the Lord? You know, what can you do to me? What can you do to a person like that that has that kind of confidence, that kind of trust? And so I'm telling you today, as we begin to step out and trust God in the mystery, 
and the things that are unclear, but we make him our trust. We make him our refuge. We make him our one thing we run to for safety. He will always come through for us. And no matter what we face, we are promised eternal life without all of these things that oppress us now, without all of the suffering we see around the world, we are promised an eternity where he says, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. It's so beautiful. He says in heaven, there's not going to be another baby die. There's not going to be another lion killing a lamb. They're going to lay down together. I mean, that's like two very different species. One's got a lot of teeth. <laughs> One is very cute and cuddly. <laughs> and a lion technically would want to eat a, a lamb. But he says, guess what? In heaven, there's going to be no such thing. There's going to be no need to devour. Imagine that. No need to devour. No need to hunt. No need to look at death. No need for any of these things. And so these people we read about that we admire, guys, some of them that died for their faith, they placed their hope in a better life, it says, after the resurrection. That's what they all were standing on. That's what we all need to be standing on. Our world is shaking. We haven't noticed. I mean, we're voting on if people can change gender. And I take the stand on protecting our kids. We have to protect their children. Ain't no one going to hurt them. Do a surgery to them when God made them exactly who they need to be. We're living in a world that is shaking, so we have to stand on something solid. God's word is that solid foundation. It is. He says he holds the word higher than his name. The earth is going to shake. The world is going to shake. But God, <laughs> if we build our life on this shelf, we will not be shaking like the rest of the world around us. We'll have a solid thing we're standing on. And that's why people will look at you and be like, where, how are you so calm? How are you so confident? How are you like standing right now? Why are you not freaking out? <laughs> like, because my trust is in God. God's got me. You know, Psalms 91, if you're ever afraid when things are happening, I, I recommend that chapter. The whole chapter is about God protecting you and keeping you safe. But all these people here, they earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind for them, that they would not reach the perfection, it says, without us because God was still, this is pre-Jesus, he was planning to redeem the whole human race through the suffering of one. All these people, it's just even more inspiring. They had that much faith before Jesus? Like, how much more faith can we have in him and trust him with everything we have, with our kids, with our lives, with our families' lives? For those of you still praying in loved ones into God's family, you know, we can put our trust in this because we have the promise that God was giving all these people so far beyond where we're at today. How much closer are we to that now? And so I want to share a little bit as I know we, I got it. I can go off on faith. Gosh, God, I've been living this for a long time. I got saved at nine years old and I started following Jesus and saying yes. <laughs> and I just haven't stopped. <laughs> but that was how it got started. And missionaries came to my church, influenced, plant some seeds, left for Asia, and some of them were from Africa. And I said, by the time I was 12, I said, yes, God. I didn't just get saved. And th this is something that I like to share because when we get saved and born again, we're receiving forgiveness for our sins. But the second, if you will, just one way to describe it, the second wave like getting saved, is giving God our life. And that makes all the difference in the world. It's not just receiving forgiveness for sins. You give him yourself. You give him all of you. So there's a two-way covenant here. It's not just us receiving every blessing from Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to live my best life. Catch you later, you know. <laughs> it's, no. No. You give him all of yourself. And the result of that covenant relationship, Bible says, your life is not your own. 
When you're married, you're in covenant. Your life's not your own. You can't just go do whatever you want to do. You can't be like, I'm married, but I'm going to go to the club, honey, and uh, I'm going to meet a bunch of people. Like, no, that don't work. <laughs> that marriage is going to end very quickly. <laughs> I'm not a prophet, but I would predict <laughs> y'all aren't staying together. Because <laughs> the covenant requires trust. A covenant requires trust on both sides, and it requires each person taking a step towards one another and saying, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to do, I'm going to be with you through the good and the bad. And I'm going to give you everything I have. And I know my husband's going to give me everything he has when I need it, right? That's a covenant. So when we come to Jesus and we accept him as our Lord and Savior, a lot of Christians, I'm so surprised by this because I was not taught this Christianity. They receive forgiveness for their sins. And then it is just about receiving, receiving, receiving. And you will get very frustrated with God if you live your life this way, only looking to receive. Like, you will live your life so frustrated. And you won't be close to God. Your prayers will go unanswered. All these things start happening, right? It starts piling up on you. But to trust God with everything is to actually give him your life Enter into that covenant. Jesus said to pick up your cross in Luke 9. Pick up your cross and follow me. That was the call to follow him, to be with him, to be a part of the group, to be a part of the family. Pick it up and follow me. He said, basically, you got to be willing to die. I need you guys willing to die if you want to follow me. It was a death sentence. The cross is beautiful today because of Jesus. It was a death sentence back then. It was a torture, symbol of torture, a symbol of punishment. Now it's beautiful because Jesus made it beautiful. Jesus is the king of all, making painful things beautiful. And he gives us women the role of birthing, where we experience some of that pain. Or you experience it in delivery, in delivering a child, a life into the world. God created life into the world. Like, we get a glimpse of what God is able to do, create, to birth things. But it requires pain. All of these things require pain and suffering. And someone's got to do it. In order for us to trust God and to receive everything he has for us, we may experience pain, we may experience loss, we may experience disappointments, we may experience suffering, we may experience torture, like we may experience death. That would be the ultimate thing. Beyond that, no one could do anything to you. It doesn't mean it's coming from God. We're in a perishable world though, and this world knows pain. There's no getting around that. The Son of God himself had to come and die and experience great pain, it says in Isaiah 53. By his wounds we are healed now because he was punished. He was suffered. He died. He even tried to get out of it. Like, it was not fun for Jesus. He wasn't like, yay, I'm going to go die, you know, so the world can be saved. He's like, if I could get out of it, I would. But I can't do that. I'm committed. Why was he committed? Because he saw you and me. He says it was for the hope before him, Christ endured the cross. He endured suffering. He endured hardship because he saw his kids. Ah, Jesus, who never married. Jesus, who never had a child. He saw us becoming a part of his family as a result of what he was going to endure for us. And it says... For the joy, joy, imagine that. I'm going to find y'all the verse, if y'all don't believe me. <laughs> y'all been in church for a while, I know you know this. For the joy, think about, think about that. He endured. Jesus endured for us. It's in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Uh, let us run, it says, with endurance the race God set before us. We do this, how? By keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. 
Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He's in a place of blessing now. He's in a place of rest now, it says. But he endured how? How did he endure? What helped him endure? Because of the joy awaiting him. How do we endure? What are we standing on? How do we endure hardship? How do we endure disappointment beyond belief? It feels crushing at times. How do we endure grief? That's a heavy one. Past few years, everyone in the world has experienced heavy grief, heavy loss, pain. How do we endure it, guys? We got to have something else we're looking towards. I'm telling you, if we discover the secret, we'll discover the secret of the ancient church world. They're looking toward the heavenly home. It says that in Hebrews 11. They were all looking towards something that would not perish, that would not be passing away, that would not be temporary, that life in heaven is forever. So everything here is short. It's temporary so we can endure it. Hallelujah. (laughs) And I'm telling you, It's great in a message like this, but I know it's hard on a daily basis because I walked the road of faith and trust. When we started believing for our family and for our kids, we had seen God answer so many prayers to get us, you know, to where we are now. God just answered one prayer after the next. We'd even test it. Be like, why are kids not coming? Is it our faith? Let's test it. Let's believe God for $10,000. A couple of days, $10,000. Let's believe God for... I don't know. Let's plant a church over here, you know, in in Nepal. Done. We need a car. Let's test our faith with that. We got a car like the next day. I'm like, let's go back to praying for kids. Okay, God, (laughs) we got your ear. Let's pray for our kids. I want kids. I want kids, God, you know. Cricket. Cricket. And we rebuke the devil. Rebuke the devil off of us. I'm trying, to, trying to stop my seed. Trying to, <laughs> you know, all the faith things, all the faith things. We made a list of confessions. We, every prayer line for kids were like, that, that's us. I'm going. I'll do whatever. Even face shame in front of everybody praying for kids. Like, I don't care. I'm weeping. I'm crying. They're like, you'll have kids by next year. And that didn't happen. You know, they're like, you're going to have a boy first. That didn't happen. <laughs> they, they say all kind of things. You're going to have twins. I'll take twins. I'm like, I'll just take a child, Jesus. <laughs> and I say that with some humor, but let's be honest, it really hurt. I was like, God, I'm serving you. I'm doing everything you asked of me. I've given you my life. Like, I am not afraid to die for you. Like, I will do whatever you ask. I will go to these nations where people hate us. I will preach the gospel. I've preached the gospel in the front of Shiva temples, declaring boldly, God loves you. He died for your sins. And he is beckoning you to join his family today. Right now, we had drunk people over here, demon-possessed people over here. There was chaos surrounding us. I felt like God had some kind of bubble on me. I had no fear. No fear. It was, it was incredible. I felt nothing but peace. I even felt like, you know what? I must be feeling what Stephen felt in the Bible, the first martyr. Like, I feel like if someone has got a bullseye on my head right now, if I die for Jesus right here and now, I'm just going to have a greater resurrection. And it's going to be great. <laughs> like, I was in that place. I was in that high, like a spiritual high. Like, God, it was all over me. I felt fearless. Perfect love cast out all fear, by the way. God's love had just so overflowing my heart. I'm like, I will love a person trying to kill me right now. Like, that's how much love I felt. So when it came to me, I'm like, I'm God's daughter. I'm your kid. I love you, Dad. He's my daddy. Like, I love you. You've got my yes. You've had me since a child. You've carried me around the world to 30-plus nations for the gospel's sake. So why is this thing not being answered? You tell me, God. I got confrontational with him, respectfully, (laughs) but still, like, I need an answer. 
I was like, Hannah in the Bible, who birthed Samuel, a prophet for Israel. I'm like, God, why? I need an answer, why? Years go by. Years go by. And I am like, what is happening? Why is God not bringing our kids? We even thought maybe we're going to die. <laughs> Just be real. I was like, maybe that's why he's not giving us kids. I was trying to find a reason. We went to doctors. They said we can't explain it. They said, well, maybe this is a thing. So I had a couple of surgeries. Wasn't it? Didn't do anything. <laughs> and I'm just like, God, what is the deal? Like, I feel like this is now personal. Like, what are you, what's going on? And one day, I was on my face in a church. I was crying. I was begging God for answers. But I felt like God's about to burst something through me, and I didn't know what it was. So in a faith of, a declaration of faith, I said, all right, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down. I went down, and God said, he said, Darlene, I want you to save my babies. Here's a girl that's been standing on the same passage of the Bible, Isaiah 54. Let me read it to you. Isaiah 54. Sing, O bear one who is not born. That was my chapter and verse. Sing, God gave me this promise uh, 15, well, 13 years ago. He gave me this when I started believing for kids. Isaiah 54. Sing, O bear one who had not born. Ah. Uh, You've never given birth. Break into loud and joyful song, O Jerusalem. You have never been in labor for the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. That was a promise God gave me when I started believing for kids. I was still holding on to it in this moment, but I get to the altar to talk to God, and he tells me, Darlene, save my babies. And I'm, like, crying because, you know, when God speaks to your heart, it's so touching. I mean, it's like an arrow to your heart. And it's just everything in me was weeping. Everything, I had mascara running, you know, the whole, <laughs> the whole ugly cry thing going. And God said, I want you to go after the ones that no one wants. I want you to go after children who have no one, who have been abandoned, who have been desolate, and have no one. And so I'm like, yeah, my yes. I'll do it. Yeah, my yes. And I get up off the floor. I'm like, I don't know how, but. We're, we're going to start saving kids. Wherever Jesus wants, Jesus gets, you know. But then I talk to the Lord. I'm like, you have my yes, but why? Why is this prayer in my heart, this desire to be a mom? Like, why are you, why? Why this wait? I was like, you know I'm praying this. Like, I know you do. Like, I've seen him work miracles. I don't deny that. I know he can what's the deal? What's going on? <laughs> and I got a response. I don't know if everybody gets a response, but I, I did get a response from him that day. I had him in the altar for a moment. I caught him. <laughs> Some people say, can we really catch God? But for a moment, I had him. <laughs> he told me to save his baby. So now I'm like, you need to answer this prayer. <laughs> you have my yes. I will do it. And I have. And then we are. I was like, but what gives? Why is this prayer not being answered? I need an answer, Jesus. And I heard a response that was very soft. And it was very emotional. And it surprised me. I, I heard Father God crying. <laughs> and he was sorry. <laughs> I said, He said, I've needed, I, I'm sorry for the wait, but I've needed you to feel what I feel. The ache you feel to be a mother. The ache you feel for me to answer this. He said, I feel every day for these kids who have no one, no home, no parent, no one taking care of them. He's like, I need you to feel that. I need that to drive you. I didn't like hearing that. Because he still didn't answer if he was going to give his kids. <laughs> I still didn't have an answer. I just understood now that 
it was going to be in God's timing. And that's all there was to it. So I surrendered it. I said, God, here we are. You have my womb. You have our, plan our family planning book. Like, I have to give up control here. No amount of my faith claiming it can bring it to pass. Now, I don't know about some of you in this room, but the reason I'm sharing this is because we all sometimes have faced things that have felt like a wall. What am I up against? And you think it could be the devil, so you rebuke the devil, take your authority. You know, you have every right to do so as a child of God. We take our authority in Jesus' name. And when it is the devil, because we've dealt with spiritual stuff like that a lot, you feel a break in the spirit, and you feel it go. You feel a shift. But I'm telling you, when there is something that God is directing in your life, and he is steering you in a direction, it won't move. No matter how hard you kick, it won't move. Jacob wrestled with God in the Bible, you know that? He did not walk away the same. He walked away blessed, but he had a limp. The more we wrestle against the plan that God has you on, the thing he's called you to do, you may be wrestling with him about, the more it will only hurt you if you're wrestling him. He doesn't want to hurt you. That's the thing. God is like, it's like this, you know. He's like when your kids eh, throw in a tantrum, you're like just trying to keep them from hitting you too hard. But you're not trying to hit them. And that's the way God is with us. Sometimes we throw a tantrum at the thing that he's calling us to do. He's calling us to do this. And we're like, but I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to do it this way. I'm supposed to have a child this way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this way. And God's like, no. I want you to have a child this way. <laughs> Receiving my children that don't have a mother. Receiving them. And it was not a joyful thing. It was a thing we wrestled with. But we started obeying overseas. We we built, our, we opened a first home for kids. And that was, I tell you what, when that happened, I felt so much joy. So much joy and freedom in feeling like, okay, if this is what Jesus wants, Jesus is going to have my heart. I gave him my life. My life is not my own. I can't tell God what to do. My life is his. And if he's calling me to this, I'm going to yield to that. And as I did, I started experiencing joy. I started experiencing so much joy. <laughs> and when I got to meet those children over there, I tell you something in me, the, the mama heart in me exploded. God gave me an experience that I met these Kids that can't even speak English, but maybe a few words to me. They call me Alma. It means mom. And when they put those flowers on me to receive me and to welcome me into the village, I just broke. <laughs> and it was like all this pain, all these years of birthing, all these years of pushing something forward. I just, I was the child standing right in front of me. <laughs> this is one of the kids we had birthed, you know? And then I go to the next child and the next one, and I'm like, Wow. I started remembering Isaiah 54. A single childless woman, you who have never given birth, break into that and joyful song. For you have never been in labor. You're going to have more than the children of the one who's with her husband. Now we have two homes for children built. And just house full of kids. And every one of those kids is a blessing. And I tell you, every one of them have added joy to our life. And I started to get to the point where I said, okay, God, even if you never give me children, even if you never do, I had to get to this place. And it's healthy to do so on something that is hard to accept emotionally. I said, even if you never do, God, I'll still serve you. I'll become mother to every child that has no, no mom. I'll become mama, Alma. Whatever language they, they want to say it, I'll be mama to all the babies that are orphaned, abandoned, that, that need a parent. Like, <laughs> And when I left those children in the village of Nepal, 
I'll never forget, I broke, because I was just like, I spent a couple of days with them, and that I'm, I'm a person that bonds quickly. I love, I love intensely. <laughs> like, I meet you, I love you, you know. I love, I love <laughs> And it, it, it's sincerely me. It's to this point that I have to trust some of my emotions to God, because it's hard to let go. And I had to let go of my dream of being mom the conventional way to embrace a better future that God had planned. And that suffering, that sorrow I felt, I'm telling y'all, it was the birthing of God breaking something on the inside of me. And like Jacob, I guess the wrestling, if you will, it didn't leave me the same, but I was walking in the direction that God wanted me to go. And as I was walking in that direction where he wanted me to go, I said, God, I just, I just have one prayer, and this is how I prayed it. Instead of asking for children this way, I just said, God, I just want some children I can hold on to. I just want some kids I don't have to say goodbye to, because that's crushing. Like, I love them. I, I wish I could be with them, and I was like, I was kind of down for a couple of days. I was like, God, that was just my simple prayer. I just want some children I can hold on to. And you guys... <laughs> We came back to America. It was an act of faith because God began to echo in my heart, even here in the States, say my babies, say my babies. And I'm like, are, are, are we limited on where we are supposed to do this? God's like, no. So I said, all right. I looked at my husband. I said, we need to say babies here in Chattanooga. <laughs> Where's some babies we can help here? And I looked at him. I was like, he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, I'm like, I, I'm like, what other, I'm going to be a mama. I told him, I'm going to be a mom. <laughs> I never lost faith for being a mom, by the way. I want to make that clear. I want to be a mom. And if this is God's way he wants me to be a mom, I'm going to do it. And I had to push him because he was scared for me being hurt, being able to handle it. And I, as a husband, I could understand that you want to protect your wives and and he knows how much I love. <laughs> so, true. so I was like, well, let's sign up to become foster adoptive parents. That's what we need to do. And he's like, are you sure? And I says, what other choice do we have? What other thing can we do? Doctors are a no. No peace. None of it felt right. I hated it. I hated every minute of it. I'm like, no. It's not right. And I was in sorrow. And I went to the Lord crying and weeping like, God, I don't feel like the, the level that I've been submitted to you and your calling on my life, like, I don't want it to be from doctors that make me a mom. Like, it just made me upset. I was like, it's either going to happen miraculously or some other way. And God got me to the point where I could be open to it happening another way. And I said, we got to become foster adoptive parents. <laughs> And we signed up for a class, kind of half dragged Pastor Dustin into the first class. I'm not sorry to rat you out on that one. <laughs> but he, he's like, I want you to know. <laughs> I'm not happy about this. I'm not sure about this. I want you to know. I was like, okay, but come to the first meeting. Just come. I was like, we get the classes done. And from there, I'm like, guess what? When you're approved, they could call you about a kid tomorrow, and they could say we got a child. But that's not going to happen if we're not approved. <laughs> I was like, we got to make the door open so God can answer this. Mama's heart has been, I don't know, at this point, 12 years. It's been 12 years. I got to have the door open for him to give us a child. And if we're approved, that does that. <laughs> God could do it from there. That was the push. I needed to get to that push. And then from there, I was like, it's in God's hands. But we're going to trust God that he brings us the right child. Amen. We got to that point. We submitted everything, paperwork, home study, all that fun stuff. Yeah, it's not fun, but <laughs> we got it done, hallelujah. And then we waited. And then, I kid you not, we were in this place. We had just renovated at the beginning of 2020. We were in that room where the kids are now. That room was a mess. It has so many colors on the walls, it looked like a concession stand. We took the mirrors off the walls, and the whole walls had to be patched and repaired. So my mom and I are in hazmat suits 
sanding, <laughs> mudding. Like we're covered head to toe in dust. <laughs> we're just like, we're getting this ready for Jesus's babies. You know, <laughs> all the kids that are gonna come into this place. Like they're gonna be like, we're actually excited. We're, we're excited about it. You know, we're painting. I get a phone call. I get a phone call from our caseworker. She says, hey, Darlene, you're about to get a call from placement. I go, wait, 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 what? placement? What, what does that mean? <laughs> All the terminology, you know? She's like, that means you're about to get a call for a child. And I'm like, oh. She's like, it's a baby. And I'm like, oh. a baby? I don't want to get all excited. <laughs> she's like, it's just like, yeah, I'll call you back when I have more details. And she click, hangs up. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I look at my mom. I'm like, mom, we're about to, Dustin, I'm like, we're about to get a call for a baby. And everybody just kind of stops in their tracks like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm like, we're about to get a call for a baby. And I'm getting so excited. And placement calls the next few minutes, and they told us there's an eight-month baby girl that just came into care, and she's in the emergency room. And because she has a mysterious rash over her entire body, we don't know what it is, but um, we're getting her checked out, and we need to know if you can pick her up. And I'm like, you know, holding the table, <laughs> pick her up. We're like, yeah, what time can you pick her up? I'm like, oh. How long does it take to get ready for kids, you know? <laughs> Most people have nine months. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it is like they give you a call and like that moment or a couple of hours, like we stretched it at least a couple hours so we could run to the store, get diapers, get some sleepers, get some things for a baby. <laughs> and they're in your home. And that night, <laughs> we got the call. Well, little did we know. At this time, it was still a faith declaration, a faith step, but that was our Daisy. That little baby we went to pick up, she was our first child that came in our doors. And I'm telling you, that was, that's, that's a miracle. The fact that the case went so smoothly at the end, parents surrendered, and they said, we want our kids with these people. I was just like, God. How does this happen? It happens when we trust him with our life. It happens when we trust him with his plan and not our own. It's almost unheard of to have your first placement to be exactly, I'm telling you, she's not just, she's not just a child in my home that I couldn't birth. It's like she is the child I birthed. I had a dream about her daughter and her son and they were older than they are now, but identical to those two children that are mine. How does that happen? <laughs> God's smiling and saying, Darlene, I'm answering every one of your prayers. This is my promise. Those two children are, you, are the children I brought into your life as a result of you saving my babies. And he told me, Darlene, on adoption day, the adoption day finally came two years later, by the way. Two years. When the adoption day came, I heard the Lord say, Darlene, I've answered your prayer. You've got two children you can hold on to forever. <laughs> I'm just crying, you know. I'm like, oh, God. And then he's like, but don't forget all the children that I still need you to save and rescue. And I'm like, I'm not going to forget. Now it's just a big thank you. But I'm sharing this with you guys today because there are things that we have to submit to God on. And it is hard. It may be the prayer of your heart. He's asking you to submit to him for him to do it his way and not your way. It may not be something you like to hear today. But I'm telling you, if you can submit to God at a level of saying, here's my plan, I relent control, which I know is hard for women, I give you control, Jesus. Here's my life. Here's my plan. Here's my future. But I give it all to you. So whatever you want, if you say no, I say okay. I'll do what you ask. And just to be that yielded and submitted means we can become open for something greater. Open for something more beautiful than we could have ever planned. As women who plan, God's got something better. God's got something better if we just open our heart for it, 
if we just open up the place of our heart. I had to open up the place of my heart to become a foster adoptive mom because I was so gun ho on the faith of it happening this way. I had to let that go and say, okay, God, I know you're going to do it. I know I'm going to become a mom. So my faith is, is like up here, you know. <laughs> I'm becoming a mom, whatever way it's going to happen, but I'm going to be open, Holy Spirit, to however you see to do that. By doing that, I'm telling you, we now got, what, 13, 14 kids? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and growing every day as a result of just surrendering, surrendering it all to Jesus, giving him all of ourselves, all of our plans. And tonight, I feel like I wanted to share that, and the other part I want to share about that is also God wants us to give him the broken pieces of us for him to heal. Only he can heal the broken parts of our heart, the disappointments things that we have suffered at the hands of whoever, man, earth, natural circumstances. We cannot control our lives here. We can't control everything that happens to us. So there are things we have to face as individuals, as, as sons and daughters that break us sometimes. And tonight, I feel like the Lord was like, I want people to be brave enough to even give me those parts of themselves. Because he can heal it. He can be trusted with it. Only God can make something beautiful out of a mess. He's the potter, we are the clay. What happens when a clay pot is broken? Well, the potter knows how to mend it into something beautiful. But we can't do the fixing ourselves. We can't fix our mess. We can't. There's some things he can't fix, right? But God can. The things of the, the soul, the things of the heart, like only God can fix that. And he made us so he knows how. And the beautiful thing about him is if we trust him, that we yield ourselves to him. He can turn those broken pieces into something that gives him glory. And that thing that hurt us, that thing that tried to destroy you, that thing that tried to wound you, to push you away from God, to say, is God good? Yeah. That's the lie of the enemy. That thing, that's what I'm talking about. We surrender that to God, that voice, that lying, whispering voice to him. <sighs> We could turn that thing around to a testimony. I'm telling you today, the thing that tried to destroy me in fertility, there was a spirit behind it. It tried to destroy me. God had a plan. God had an alternative plan, and it was better than anything I could have ever dreamed or hoped for, greater. And I'm so fulfilled now. It's crazy. <laughs> I just love it. I just eat up time with the kids. I eat it all up. But I had to surrender my plan and everything I thought it would look like. I had to give up the years of disappointment, the years of, oh, it didn't work within my window of I should have been 26, 28 having kids. No, it happened when I was 39. <laughs> I had to wait that long. I had to give up that. That disappointment can be a big one that hangs over us. Like, it didn't happen this way. So we hang this, like, guilt or this shroud over us sometimes of shame you know why did this happen and god's like honey you couldn't control that and the truth is we can't really control these parts of our lives anyway what we can control is our submission to god and letting him fix things letting him work things out work out the broken parts of our soul that are aching that are longing that are in pain he says, give it to me. Give it to me. So 